Nice Thank to you. meet you, bro. Hey, nice Take you. care. Good luck with the hair. <laughs> yeah, what's up with my hair? Good luck with the hair. <laughs> Shut up. Kramer's here, ladies and gentlemen. Kramer's here. What <laughs> fuck is... <laughs> well, that, that actually might work, actually. No, well, well, oh, look at that. What the fuck? What is going on? <laughs> Did he just leave? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling. I'm your host, Mark Rigadonna, and with me as always... Richie Byrne and his new hairdo. And his great hairdo. Uh, <laughs> we got a great guest. We're very excited. We're going to bring out Rob Bartlett. Uh, it's good to have you back, Rob. <laughs> I feel like it's only been a couple of weeks. The great Rob Bartlett is with us today. Uh, and we might as well, full disclosure... Mark and I did a show with Rob as our guest two weeks ago, right? Two or three weeks ago. What was that? Nobody heard that? Somebody's All recording. Right. Uh, two or three weeks ago, and uh, it was one, maybe the best show we've ever done, right, Mark? As the, it was brilliant. Because All Mark and I just sat there and let Rob go for an hour. And, uh, <laughs> and my favorite part of that show was that Rob chose to make you his whipping boy that day instead of me. It was the first time. <laughs> And it was just, I was feeling so good about everything. And Tony and I were sitting here after the show and Tony went to play it back. And you and Rob, your voices did not come out for some reason. We heard you fine, but for some reason it did not, uh, the sound did not come out. So it was a complete waste of a show. Uh, <laughs> we, we did take care of Tony though. We, we beat the shit out of him and, uh, Ease up, ease up on Tony. No, he no, because you know what? He posts these great videos on Instagram. They're always entertaining, always either funny or touching, or he's got a great eye for that kind of stuff. And two, if you have a problem with him, ask yourself this question: How much you fucking paying him? Well, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he's got? Him, you, what video? For him, the two of you guys be doing this like in an alleyway somewhere going, hey, welcome to Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling. <laughs> Don't think we haven't done that. <laughs> That's usually how we do our acts. Hey, you want to hear us? <laughs> what What do you mean, video? What videos? So this, uh, this studio head is having lunch with a talent agent and the commissary, big time studio. And uh, studio head says to the agent, he says, you ever hear of a uh, of an actress by the name of Laura Masters. And um, the talent agent goes, Laura, man, who hasn't heard of her? She is the single most untalented actress I've ever seen in my entire life. And the only reason she got to where she is now is because she's fucked everybody she's ever met. She's like the easiest person. She is. She's a whore. And to be honest with you, she's really not that good looking. And the studio head says, you know, that's my daughter. And the talent agent goes, let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> let me finish. There's nothing like a good, yeah, that's it. Repeat the joke. So you can it like a that's what, maybe if I say it again, I'll understand what it means. <laughs> Mark's going, why is she from Finland? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how are you Robbo? I'm, it was fine until about 10 minutes ago and all of a sudden my day took a sharp turn i was all set to destroy rigadonna and then you come in with this hair hat and i, I know uh, it's i don't know what happened I'll, I'll, tell I'll tell you what happened <laughs> no i'll tell you what happened i you were asking me didn't i look in the mirror well when i, I left the house I went out today. I had some errands to run. And one of the errands I was going to run was go to the bank. I had some checks and I put the checks in my glove compartment. And then I went to the, the, the uh, beer distributor. 
And I had some bottles in the car. So I'm putting the bottles in a bag. I'm going to bring them in and, you know, all that shit. <laughs> so at one point, I find something. I forget what it was on the floor. And I put it in the glove compartment. So now I go in. I do the bottles. I buy bo- I buy new buy water. I go home. I finish. And I look. I can't find the che- one of the checks. One of the checks is missing. And it was uh, the show I did Saturday night for uh, Paul Anthony. So it was in uh, your hair? It you? was in <laughs> You know, Tony, hopefully your mic doesn't work today. So <laughs> I lost the fucking check. Uh, when, yeah. And uh, so I ran back to the bottle place it's to see if maybe they, the story's so bad, Tony's leaving and he has one leg. So <laughs> I. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. I don't know. I guess at the bottle place, I was looking outside and the wind was blowing. And it, I don't know. Something happened to my hair. Did you find the check? No. Oh, that sucks. No. <laughs> oh, to be wild. I'm sorry. You just, wait, wait. Did you just say something? Oh, yeah. That's a much better look. <laughs> Wait, I can't get these on now. I'm just upset that you didn't have to alter that thing. That why does my why does that that was for me? So why is that fitting on your head? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because I have a huge head. I, I guess is that is that your point that I have a huge head with this bad hair? I look terrible. All right, well, it's great, guys. I gotta go. I got a gig in uh, December. Um, <laughs> You are the worst fucking hosts on the planet. I mean, it's just like if you're coming looking like, you know, one of those pencils that you do this and the hair goes. Remember, remember those pencils? They, they used to have the crazy hair. And, yeah. And then Rick Adana, he's got a green screen and somebody's going to tell him it's not supposed to stay green. It's supposed to be stay <laughs> <stranger." laughs> he, He's still learning how to use it. He's He hasn't gotten through all the directions yet. I'm only on step three. It, it, what are you doing this from? Like a garage at Enterprise Rent a Car? <laughs> I might have to. I might have to do it from an Enterprise Rent a Car. What, Rich? You all I, right? No, I'm I'm overwhelmed at how bad I look. But now you know what we've been suffering with for the past 15 years. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Richie, I'm that, I'm glad that's that, uh, better now. Yeah, you look great. Oh, yeah, much better. <laughs> look like a rooster that just stuck his dick into an electrical socket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I lost the check. Um, Didn't well, find it? You know. No, no. I ended somebody, up. Somebody can lend you 50 bucks. I ended up calling. I just called Paul Anthony. It was his show. I don't know. I got it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we had to laugh at all of your jokes, Rob. I, no, 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 no. I thought no, the no, let no. me finish was good enough for a good 20 minutes. Then we okay, okay. Well, somebody's got to say something. Otherwise, it's like <laughs> the past 17 minutes talking about you. Speaking of that <laughs> show, <laughs> I ran. I saw Bob Nelson the other night. Where? At, he was at the show. Um. And Vinny Mark, Vinny Mark was on performing. The show. Yeah, he's doing. What's their names? Baker and yeah, yeah. yeah Scott Baker. Yeah, he and Scott Baker are doing a two man thing. Yeah, an, an improv show. Yeah, they're great. Bob, Bob and Scott Baker. Yeah, and uh, I just saw Scott Baker at a benefit on the Sunday. Did you really? Yeah, he didn't mention anything about Bobby. Because, I don't think he knew who I was. Maybe because no, no, uh, not not Bob and and Scott. No, Vin, Vinny, and Vinny, Scott. Mark, and Scott are doing. Oh, Vinny, Mark. Oh, okay. So, okay. and I haven't seen Vinny in over twenty years, and you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you're not missing all that well, much. I'm sure. Well, you know, Jody just died. His wife, Jody, Jody oh, Weiner. Oh, yeah, geez. about what three months ago, maybe. Uh, so Bob oh, actually man. stopped in to see Vinny uh, to see how he was, was doing, which I thought was really sweet of Bob. Bob's so, a great guy, but Bob looked great. He looked great. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks Best to us. 
Yeah, thanks. <laughs> you know what he said, Bob? Rob, you know what he said? I go, hey, Bob. He goes, hey, Richie. I go, what, what are you doing here? He goes, I came to see Vinny. Uh, you know, and you. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't yeah, mean it do. as a joke. Like, he actually felt bad that he said that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> oh. uh, when uh, did you meet Bob? Um, I met Bob when I started out at Dixon's. Yeah. Uh, in Massapequa, uh, it was 1970, late 77 or early 78. Wow. And Richard M. Dixon's, uh, White House Inn was this little, uh, bar slash restaurant It sat maybe about a hundred people. Um, and he was doing a Wednesday night comedy show, you know, a talent showcase. It wasn't just comedy because he had singers and magicians and, and, uh, and then they had weekend shows, but they didn't have weekend shows for the longest time because when I first did it, I saw an ad in, in it was like the Long Island Press. It's asked how long ago it was. And um, so I decided I was trying to do stand up. I've been taking this stupid class with this guy named Irving Dalvin that I found in backstage. And um, so I, I, I went to Dixon's one night. It was a Wednesday night. And I went on at like three o'clock in the morning. Um, there were about 80 people on, on the show and about 12 people in the audience. And so I didn't go back. And then a couple of months later, I'm at the, the Dalvin thing and, and Bobby Collins was one of the people there. And, uh, you know, I was talking about Dixon's. I said, yeah, I'm not, you know, that place is, it's, no, they're hanging up the rafters now. And so I went back and that was exactly what happened. And then it, Bob and I kind of hit it off right off the bat. And, uh, we were two of the original Magnificent Seven. Uh, that kind of really started Long Island comedy. Who were the seven? Seven was uh, Bob, me, Martling, Richie Minervini, Jim Myers, Dave Hawthorne. I'm missing somebody. Woods? Bobby Woods. Bobby Woods. He was the seven. So, wow. And then we used now to alternate Eddie Murphy with Jeff Zabrowski and John Farentino. They were like the, the fill-in eighth. It was like, you know, being the fifth Beatle. It was like the eighth Magnificent Wow. Seven. But it was a rotating thing, you know. Now, I, I know a lot of those names. There's some of them that I don't. Did you guys, when you guys started doing shows, how, how different was everybody? Because you and Bob kind of have a similar thing where you do characters and improv improv with each other and that different kind of stuff and jackie's jokes set up punch right. richie richie's like a little of everything he's like well because he's doing everybody else's act um, <laughs> it's funny how that works um you're very versatile <laughs> he meant minervini x that's what i said oh i thought you, you thought he meant me no, not you. <laughs> no, no, you, don't, no, no. you don't have an act burn. You're trying to get over on your good looks alone, which is why <laughs> you've never made it to the bigs. It's why you're never going to make it to the majors, Richie. It's just not going to happen. And that hairdo is a perfect example why. If and the, 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 if you need a, a symbol, you, you know, but do you, if you remember, of why you've never made it to the bigs, just look in the mirror, take a look at that hair. <laughs> you're the Jake Taylor of comedy. When we who? Jake Taylor. <laughs> That's good. Make another fucking obscure reference, Rick Adana. Jesus, Palomino. <laughs> Why do you do it with him? Seriously, he's dead wood, Richie. And that's I, well, kind of ironic, me saying that up to you, that he's dead wood. I said I, I wanted to find somebody who has less credits in the business than me. Obscure. It's fewer, fewer credits. Fewer, fewer credits <laughs> than me. Thank you, fucking professor. Jesus. And, so, uh, uh, the seven of us and... Uh, we kind of started, you know, one well, well, Bobby now, and I both used uh, suitcases. We were both prop backs at the beginning. But, you know, really? my, I used, yeah, I, I used to do props just to, like, augment the characters. I was always doing characters. Um, you know, whether it was Dogs at a Cocktail Party or the Tom Carvel bit, or I was always doing things, you know, in, in a character. Because my, my background was all in acting, so... Um, and I thought doing stand up would be the quickest way of getting an acting gig because at yeah. that time it's when Steve Martin and Robin Williams and Richard Pryor were all making the segue to movies, you know, TV and movies. So, um, and why were you, you weren't in that movie that they made here, right? That uh, right, Rider PI, yeah, yeah, it just it, it was, there it was one reason 
the, the only reason why I wasn't in that movie. What? Self-respect. <laughs> I, I actually used to have, I don't know where I got it. Maybe Joey Cola. I had a, D, a VHS of that movie. Yeah, I know. It never made it to DVD. I'll put it to you that way. Yeah, it was a VHS. So it was. It was a VHS, and it I was actually, horrendous. It was so it was bad. Worse than horrendous. Here's how bad it was. I used to live in Bayside. There used to be a theater on Bell Boulevard, and Gary and I went to see it. But we bought tickets for another movie just so that we weren't going to be supporting financially. <laughs> Ryder PI. Um, Hawthorne was in his glory. He was a star of a major, major motion picture. Yeah, he was uh, in his head. Uh, and and you know, Bob rented a limo to go to the premiere at the Hicksville Theater. Um, there were four people in the audience to see the show. Two of them were Bob and Dave Hawthorne. And um, then it was like a whole bunch of other people who were in it, including Joey Cola, tour de force as the chef. Yeah, he yes, Joey. Uh, yeah. Bob Woods was in it. Bob Woods was in it. The late uh, Bob Woods. Minervini. Yeah, Howard Stern. Yeah, John Howard Mul Stern was actually funny. John Mulroney. Yeah, well, you know, in that, um, 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 it was just uh, it was awful, 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 awful. I'll tell you about it. Was I saw it once, and three people walked out on it. Three people walked out on it, and it was I saw it on a plane, so <laughs> it was really fucking bad. Wait, I'm gonna do Rick and Donna. Three people saw it on a plane. <laughs> He's he got you up. nailed, Mark. He has got you nailed. He's got your number, pal. <laughs> nailed. But no, really. It's Mark is a fascinating conversationalist. I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks, and he says, "Yeah, just before I logged on, I had to deal with my dishwasher sprung a leak. <laughs> uh, I could have gone all day and not really missed that <laughs> comment. Just." I thought we were friends. Yeah, I mean, we are friends. But, you know, why would I give a shit about your fucking dishwasher? And then he picks like up his we dog friends. to try and tug on the hard shit. Picks up his new dog to make me feel bad. This adorable new dog named Happy. By the way, really stretching that creative muscle of yours, coming up with Happy for a dog. Why wouldn't yeah. he? He can lick his own balls. I mean... Oh, those... Fucking seven year olds. They, they're not well read yet. So oh, they just well, go with. As long as the kids. That's it. Blame it on the kids. What a great dad. <laughs> His other dog's what name is dad. Biff. I blame my career on him. So. Your, your wife catches you cheating on him. What are you going to do? Blame the kid? <laughs> he made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is this a Jackie Gleason thing where it's the coffee cup and there's really scotch in there? Is that is that what you're doing? No, it's, it's a scotch cup. People think there's coffee. In. Is it? <laughs> I mean, it's twenty after one. You're you're three hours late. Normally, you kick it around eleven, don't you? Oh, adorable! You think it's my first? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I saw recently? Um, speaking of Jackie Gleason, the the episode where he apologized to the audience for the game show. Have you ever seen it? You know the story. He had a game show, and. The first week of the show, it was a weekly show, and he hosted it, and and it completely bombed. It bombed. God, I can't think of the name of the show. And he came on the next week and did a half an hour apologizing for how bad the show was. Um, who does that? <laughs> what kind? Of, I mean, and he was hysterically funny. It was, and that was the whole show was him sitting there, no set, nothing, just talking about how bad the show is. And he said, "I promise." I'll never put it on again. And that was it. They never did the show again. Joey Cole used to do the same thing when he would do the crowd warm up for uh, for Rosie. He would apologize for the show before it even started. You're in the picture. <laughs> You're in the picture. I don't want you. I, I just want people to merge. I just want people to merge. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite was Joey. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Remember the. <laughs> The the woman in in the south with the letting everyone go ahead of her, and then he did the woman from New York, with, mm -hmm. and he used to tease his hair, and all that was mm -hmm. very funny, man. It was great. Yeah. What do you do? He's such an asshole. You're such an asshole. He's off touring with the Sopranos. I know. I, I know. love that. I, I'm know. the friggin' comic who was in the Sopranos, and he gets the big bucks touring with them. <laughs> not bitter or anything. You know, Cola's not his real name. I well. 
it's close. Well, he changed the spelling of it because he thought it was going to be blackballed because it sounded too too German and there were too many Jews in show business. <laughs> Is that true? That's what he told me. Ah, come What's on. His real last name, Hitler? Well, yes. no, it's, it's <laughs> Kohler, but it's Kohler, but it's spelled a German way. It's Borman. It's like cola, like, you know, Pepsi. It's like, uh, cola, like the toilets. Like, yes. Cola, C-K-O-H-L-E-R, I think it is. The faucet. We prefer to say faucet. Well, this yeah, toilet. Let's say too. Joey Cola with the toilet. <laughs> we saved that for the Rick and Donna. Yeah. I got to go to the Rick and Donna. <laughs> he was... Uh, he was on some, I don't know if it was Facebook, whatever it is. He did, did this long thing where he's being interviewed with somebody. And he went on and on and on about how Richie Minervini was the greatest person and the funniest guy and how much he's done for him, whatever. And, and every time I'd see Joey, he'd say, you're the reason why I'm doing comedy. <laughs> so after this whole thing with Minervini, I was like, Joey, this, I don't own a club. Is that why? I mean, is that the, the reason why? He says, do you want it to solidify your, your, your spot at the east side? I mean, just... I'm the reason Joey Cola got on uh, Kelly Clarkson? Uh, Fallon. Jimmy Fallon. Really? Yes. Be and I, do you want to hear the story? Sure. Yes. Well, I have an hour and a half. <laughs> no, uh, the Jimmy Fallon used to shoot across the hall from the Dr. Oz show. Mm -hmm. And when Dr. Oz show was beginning, uh, they called Joey and Joey recommended me. So he brought me in the first day and he was going to do the first show. I was going to do the second show. And uh, Fallon saw him in the hall with me and went berserk and was like, you got to, I, I haven't seen you in years. How are you? You got to do my show. And I stood there going, <laughs> and a month later, Joey was on Jimmy Fallon's show. And I was, <laughs> I was not. <laughs> That's like when <laughs> Fort Lauderdale comic strip, I was there with Eddie. And um, it was the first time Eddie was on the road. And Ronnie Dangerfield had a, a condo somewhere close. And he used to stop in at the strip every once in a while to try out material. And it was right after Caddyshack had hit. And he was like the the, the new best thing in, in the world. And and uh, so he'd stop in there whenever he had a Carson shot coming up to try out material. And he'd show up in, you know, the, the two-piece, the velour shorts and 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 uh short sleeve shirt set you know with the, with the tan and um he'd do his act and the crowd would go crazy and so and he, and he says uh oh he says and he wanted me to like sit in and and you know and then come come out to the bar and then he would go over each line what do you think of this what do you think of that and i'm thinking you're asking me it was like wow. it's was, it was really really cool and wow. uh, so Eddie says, Ronnie, Ronnie, you got to see Mac, man. You got to see Mac. Go, yeah, kid, yeah. So he says, I said, yeah, you know, do me a favor. Go in and watch his act for me. So Rodney comes in and Eddie goes up and does his, you know, his, uh, his 10 minutes of material and then his tribute to Richard Pryor. And then um, <laughs> comes out, you know, and of course he's filthy. And he comes out and he goes, Rodney, Rodney, man, what'd you think? What'd you think? And Rodney Dangerfield says, kid, you're funny, but uh, where are you going to go with it? Two weeks later, he had his first audition for Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you were there oh. because Eddie, I'm Eddie, the one who told him they were looking for somebody. I've <laughs> seen Eddie Murphy tell that story, and then he said that like a year later, they were at the Oscars, and he no. was in the bathroom at the stall, and Rodney came up next to him and <laughs> turned over, looked at him, and went, "Who knew?" <laughs> 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 It was the first, the night before we went down to Fort Lauderdale, Nelson was doing a um, a Merv Griffin show. Merv used to come to the East Coast and he would do like a week or two weeks worth of shows from Lincoln Center. And Bobby was booked. He was uh, he was one of the first one of us to be signed uh, to an agent. He was APA, which he got because he, he was in the New York Big Laugh Off. He took my spot because I couldn't get off from work at because I got switched to nights. At, at, I was a plus janitor, he was in Ryder PI, a janitor slash security guard, and um, and so he he's doing Merv Griffin, and we're all it was Minavini, me, and a couple other people were in the green room, and his agent comes in and says, you know, gives him the 
the Rod Steiger, sorry, kid, it's not, you know, it's not your night. He was getting bumped. Um, and uh, by the way, since you guys know any black comics, they're looking for a black comedian for Saturday Night Live. The guy that they hired um, is, is yeah. illiterate. He doesn't know how to read. And he couldn't yeah. read scripts. And that was Charlie Barnett. Charlie who was Barnett. A brilliant street performer. Brilliant. Yeah. And uh, and Bob turns to me and he goes, don't you dare tell Eddie. Because at that point, we'd be doing the identical triplets, you know, the three of us. And it was, you know, we would do everything together. And, and, and Nelson just could not deal with the fact that Eddie was going to be getting, you know, inside track on Saturday Night Live before he or I did. And um, so we're on the plane. And I told Eddie. And we were on the ground maybe 45 seconds. I'm waiting for the luggage. And he's at the he's at the payphone calling Richie Tinkin. And Bob Wax wow. came and said, you know, you guys got to get me an audition Saturday Night Live. And they did. And they did. And that's how they ended up managing him. You know, I guess they said, well, you know, we'll get you there. But you got, if anything happens, we're going to manage it. And he, um, they strung him along the entire summer. They just kept, they were hemming and hawing. He kept going in. He'd come over to my house and he'd sit at the kitchen table and, and he would just pour his heart out. My mother would say, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And he'd really? be like, try to make him feel better about it, you know? And his parents were giving him a hard time. He was working in a shoe store at the Roosevelt Field Mall. He, uh, he, he just, you know, and he wanted it more than anything else. And, you know, and he, he deserved it, you know, and he knew he deserved it. And finally they brought him out as a featured player. Yeah, and that then, was when they started that. I, right. So you were there for all that. I forgot that you'd be there for all that. They treated yeah. him like shit the whole first season. They were horrible. But, you know, although the writers really liked him, and then once he got in with the right writers and they knew what he could do, then it was clear, you know, that they had obviously made a mistake by not featuring him earlier on or making him a prime time player. Earlier yeah, on. it was the first time I saw him at Dixon's. First time I saw him at Dixon's, I thought to myself, this kid is going to be huge. Really? It'd be huge. You could just tell. He just had that factor. I mean, just naturally funny, really, really talented, great actor, and and just amazing, you know, and, and you just knew. You just knew he was gonna make it. So wow. Because yeah. I that year my brother and my best friend were uh went to the prom and they went to the comic strip after the prom. And the next day I said, you know, how was the prom? And they were like, forget the prom. The, they were like, you at the comic strip was unbelievable. And they said, there was this black kid there. He's And they kept going, he's our age. He's our age. Like they couldn't believe it. And they said, he was so funny. He's going to be on Saturday Night Live this this fall. And it was Eddie. Really? Thanks, Rob. Great story. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Who else was on the show, the comic strip? <laughs> Yeah, what, what what did they do after they went to the show? Did they get late? Was well, the problem? We can fix that in, in pro it later. Right? <laughs> in post, <laughs> Tony's going to fix all this in post. Yeah, thank can you, you just Tony. Edit them out, Tony. Yeah. Can you just edit them out and just have me. <laughs> Welcome, the to hour? <laughs> Welcome to the Rob Bartlett hour. <laughs> that's right. That's right. As well it should be for all you guys who are contributing to this thing. So. <laughs> yeah, all right, Rich. I, I got to be honest, Mark. The last time he was on, he did all the talking. So I think we're both well, expecting somebody that has to fill in the blanks. I mean, these just gaping pauses where, you know, I'm waiting for a question. I'm waiting for somebody to say something that's interesting. I'm waiting for you to, to like, you know, lead me into something. It's just <laughs> one of the worst hosts I've ever encountered in my life. Absolute worst. I can't. It's the hair. It's fucking me up today. I'm sorry. Oh, every time mm -hmm. I look up to talk to you, I see worst my hair. And, and I did the Joe Franklin show three times, and I know from bad hosts. <laughs> Actually, he was talking about amazing, what was that like? He was an amazing host. I did it. I did it once. Um, there was a, a, a woman, I don't know if she's still alive. She was 108 back then, who played the musical glasses. That was her thing. She had like this set of glasses yeah i remember her. glasses and she would yeah she did a record she did a record of christmas oh that gary my gary grant my manager arranged he did all the arrangements and then he um managed her and got her on joe franklin and of course part of the deal was they had to take me as well and so i was on with gloria parker and a guy i forget his name but he was the holocaust poet he was a guy who had written poetry 
uh, when he was in uh, Treblinka or Dachau, one of those, as a kid, he had written stuff like on toilet paper, whatever it was. Not Victor Franklin, it was, was it? it? No, no, no. It was, what's that? Frankel. Victor Franklin or Frankel? No, it was Joe Franklin. <laughs> Joe Franklin was the name of the show, Mark. Um, and so <laughs> I get up, of course, you know, I'm the low man in the totem pole. I get up, I do, you know, dogs at a cocktail party, whatever 10 minutes I did. And there's no audience, but I'm making the cameraman laugh, so I'm, I'm doing good. And then Gloria Parker goes on and she plays, you know, Oh, come all you faithful on the musical glasses. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, Joe had this thing where he would try to get everybody involved together. He tried to incorporate everybody. And he would get, like, you could be on a show with Liza Minnelli and and uh, and Peggy Lee and some guy who owned a deli in Brooklyn and and some old guy who saved string. You know, th 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 yeah. this was a typical Joe Franklin show. And he would say, we're going to go see Lyle at the Palace, my friends. And then we're going to go see Peggy Lee at the Carlisle. And then we're going to go to um, Ed Meneman's uh, Pastrami King. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll get some string and we'll give it to you. And he would always, you know, try to incorporate everybody. And so says Rob Bartlett, my friends, Rob Bartlett, uh, funny man, Rob Bartlett, tell me, what did you think of Gloria Parker? The musical glasses and i said it's really great i said but i noticed some dogs have shown up when when she hit the high notes she was not happy with me for that she was really and so it's all gloria parker what did she what did you think of her I brought my friend she goes eh, it didn't really uh i wasn't that impressed and so then he goes to we'll be right back my friends after this message from cut soda and joseph speaker in 16 varieties of ethnic breads with whatever this guy's name was morris handelman the holocaust poet he comes out and you know you, you get on the chair and then you bump onto the couch and then say him he, he sits next to joe and so gloria's on my left i'm on, on her right and there's like another spot because there's going to be four guests and uh he reads these poems and one is more heartbreaking and horrifying than the next and everyone is like weeping it, it, they're just so powerful um and there, the Holocaust poet, my friends, reminding us of a time that we all need to remember, although we'd rather forget. We'll be right back after this message from Joseph Speakerman, 16 Varieties of Ethnic Breads, with Hannibal the Clown. And I look at the cameraman, and the cameraman looks at me and he goes, <laughs> So Hannibal is this woman, birthday party clown. She's in the full puffy suit, the big shoes, you know, the hat. <laughs> And on her clown suit, she has bells, a whole bunch of different kinds of bells. She has bicycle bells and the little school bells. And she's got, you know, these little jingle bells. And she's got one of those horns from a bike, you know, bike horn, one of those. And she does this <laughs> pantomime. Her act is she does this pantomime about a little kid losing a balloon at the fair. Doesn't speak. She just uses the ding ding ding. <laughs> That's the whole thing. She uses the she uses the the horn to represent her. You know, she's talking to the guy. <laughs> ding 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 ding. <laughs> so she comes over and sits down, and he says, uh, "Hannibal the Clown, my friends. Hannibal, what did you think of Rob Bartlett, funny man Rob Bartlett?" And Hannibal goes. And what did you think of Gloria Parker little musical glasses at Christmas time? <laughs> and what did you think about Morris Hanneman, the Holocaust poet? And she squeezes the bulb and the bicycle horn really gently and slowly. So it goes. And she goes. <laughs> I turn to the camera guy and I'm so glad I'm on the end part of the couch because <laughs> I had to turn around because I, I start to lose it. And I just, I can't, and the cameraman's starting to laugh. And the two of us, I'm like coughing and I just, I can't. One of the more amazing things. One of the more amazing that would be things. Such a funny sketch. It's got to be, it's got to be on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> I hope, yeah. It's got to so. be somewhere. I would hope so. We, and we have to show it. <laughs> It's so fucking funny. Oh my god, it was such it was just one of those moments, you know. If you're too mm -hmm. young to remember Joe Franklin, like that's that's a normal Joe Franklin show. It was like a normal Joe Franklin show. I mean, Spinal Tap was on Joe Franklin. <laughs> um Aerosmith was Aerosmith? No, it wasn't Aerosmith. It was um uh, 
what's that? Um, Angel is my centerfold. Uh, Jay Giles. Uh, Jay, Jay, Giles. Yeah, Jay Giles was one of the last band, was one of the last acts uh, on the Joe Franklin show. And he had, uh, he had an uh, office above um, uh, above what used to be a porno theater. Now it's the Hard Rock in Times Square. <laughs> And he had an office that was literally four by four and floor to ceiling was stacked with newspapers and magazines. And there were all clips. It was like a rat's nest. He was like a pack rat. And he would say, did you ever hear of Billy Glazer? You'd have to, you know, meet Who him. Who had that? Show. Who's off? Joe Franklin. Was? Joe Franklin. Really? Because he used to shoot the show in this little studio above this porn theater. And, um, He's, you know, you had, to, you had to see him before you did the show. You do like a little bit of a pre-interview, or whatever. Uh, Rob Barker, my friend, is going to be a big, big, big star, big, big, big star. Um, Rob, do you, th- what do you think of when I say the words Billy Clayson? Uh, I said, I, uh, it was a great vaudeville comic. Actually had played the porno theater when it was a vaudeville house. And he gets up and he <laughs> walks over to this stack, like floor to ceiling of, of newspaper things. And he pulls two of them apart and he slides out this one little sheet and it's a clipping from variety it's a review of billy glason from like 1930 something he knew it, he knew where it every, was knew where everything was in that in that office wow Un- unless it was a setup unless he said that to everybody and just knew what that one clip was yeah maybe it was, <laughs> it was amazing it was really i amazing. do remember that theater he was an incredible yeah it's a hard rock now yeah um, yeah, you used to, you used to, that's where you used to buy your raincoats. That's <laughs> uh, actually, that's where I met Pee Wee Herman too soon. Um, <laughs> go, go back to what earlier, what were you ever considered for at that time for set at why? And why weren't you for set at live and you he, and, and Nelson? Like I would think you well, guys before be, either one of us, we, neither one of us had any management at the time. Um, I think they thought Nelson, I think, I think his agent might have got somebody to come in to look at him, and they thought he was too much of a clown, you know, with the props and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. He's always, Bobby's always fancied himself as a clown. I mean, he's got a clown mm-hmm. character that he does that he's been doing for years and years and years and years, um, Captain Boomer, and uh, he's amazing at it. Uh, he actually went, I think, or or applied to Ringling Brothers Clown College um, before he started doing Dixon's. So he, that was kind of a dream of his. And... Um, and me, I didn't have any representation. I had no in. I had no way of... Uh... Eddie brought me in to be a writer. Oh, really? Uh, it was when uh, Dick Ebersol had taken over for Gene Domanian. Um, because, you know... She, oof, what she, a year. What a year that was. Oh. And, um, Charlie and I, Rocket, rest in peace. I, I brought in some stuff, you know, and uh, he passed. He passed on it. And uh, I remember meeting him a couple of years later through Imus. And, uh, Dick Ebersol. Like, Dick Ebersol. We're talking, right. I said, uh, I, you know, I, I don't remember you, but I remember passing it. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dick. Um, but yeah. Wow. Yeah. And there's, that, now, there's that, there's that, there's that silence again. I mean, can you guys I, pick up the fucking slack? I can't talk the entire I, time. It's not my goddamn show. Well, my it's a problem responsibility for this thing that you're throwing out to everybody. <laughs> Every once in a while, it just starts going. So I, I don't know when to jump in because I don't know if somebody's talking or. Oh, broke. it's our fault. It's not your I, fault. That's why I, I'm not talking. I Jesus thought when you did Christ that, but, 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 but I thought you were imitating your uh, sink that's broken. <laughs> <laughs> Doing Vinny Nardi yellow. What um. <laughs> What would do you remember your first paid gig? <laughs> Mark, do you remember your first paid gig, Mark? No, I'm sorry, I haven't gotten one yet. I was doing my I'm frozen screen. Um <clears throat> it was an anniversary party in Brooklyn. Um somebody had seen me, I guess, at Dixon's, and uh they wanted me to do this. It was a, it was a 50th anniversary, I think. And this was like a grandson of whoever it was. And he was a, a pot dealer. 
And so he actually provided the transportation. He and his girlfriend picked me up, but they had to stop at his apartment in Queens first. And it was about 800 pounds of marijuana <laughs> in the living room and a scale. And he, I guess he was making up dime bags and nickel bags, whatever. And um, yeah, I got $100. And, um, <laughs> and I did my act. And there was a band there. It was like almost like a wedding gig. And the, I remember the guy, the, like the, the front man for the wedding band, Saying, wow, it's really tough to do what you do. Make me laugh. That's got to be a hard thing. And then, you know, <laughs> we're sitting there eating and whatever. And he was, wow, it's got to be a hard thing you do. Make me laugh. It, it, he must have said it about 15 times. It was like, it's kind of like being on this show. It was just like somebody who just had a work <laughs> night and would ask I, me a question and then expect you to say something around it, you know? It's so weird that he would say "make me laugh." Though. Yeah, no, he was like, saying, he was saying it as though like that's what the audience was saying. You know, he wasn't. Yeah, wasn't indicating that you know, I had to make him laugh. You know? Right, but still. <laughs> but I remember them doing. <laughs> I remember them doing the Sheik of Araby was one of their big songs in the night, and um, their their little hook was. Um, they would jump in when the lead singer was saying, "I'm the Sheik." Of Araby, and then the rest of the band would go without my pants on. That was the the big hook in there. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, the comedy stylings of Rob Barlow. <laughs> <laughs> I once did a show. <laughs> gigs. I once did a show. I used to do this uh, this one man thing at Club fourteen oh seven in in the city. It was the basement of a uh, luncheon club in the Garment District, and Gary and I four walled it on weekends because it was closed on weekends. And so Friday and Saturday nights, I would do this one-man show. It's how I kind of worked up to the show that I eventually brought to Broadway. And um, so um, <laughs> they booked, they used to do like group sales whenever they could. And they brought in a group of deaf people and they had an interpreter. And the interpreter did so like signed my act as I was doing it. And it was a really interesting experience. I mean, I've done a couple of Broadway shows where they do that once, you know, a year, every once in a while. They'll bring in an interpreter to do, you know, to yeah. do something, to interpret the, the show. Um, and so he he was doing my act. And it was really weird timing-wise because I would do a, a, a bit or whatever and I'd get a laugh from the hearing part of the audience. And there would, there would like be two or three seconds before he was done signing. And then I would get a laugh from... <laughs> you know the deaf people and at the end of the show all the deaf people were lined up to get the interpreter's autograph because they thought he <laughs> was he the killed and i was the interpreter for the hearing people <laughs> he killed <laughs> uh. did, that, did the interpreter do like my name's rob bartlett meaning like my name is rob bartlett or did he say this is rob bartlett Even I was like, what? I I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I, is there anything else I can be doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got Tony over here making lunch. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Are you and you're not you're not doing much performing in and I mean in the last few years you really haven't done much. Um, uh, I know you yeah. were sick for a while. Uh, yeah, I, I don't like, really want to get a little over a year ago, and that was a uh, that was not fun. The yeah. uh, you know COVID obviously was a, an issue. Yeah, uh, and are you missing it? Not really, because it, it it's the business has changed so much. You know, the audiences have changed. How long have you been doing it, you guys? Uh, 30, little over 30. Mark? 20. Okay. So I don't know if it's changed as dramatically for you guys, you know, because I've been doing it, you know. Shit, 35. Years. And, and it the business has changed so dramatically in terms yeah. of. You know, the comedy, yeah. boom. it's been two comedy booms since I started, you know, mm -hmm. I the wave of the first one. And then just in time for the, the pitfall, I got Imus. And so that kind of got me through. Uh, and then there was like, this other comedy boom. But I noticed 
how much you know, there was this whole thing with bringer shows. And then all of a sudden, you know, there weren't as many comedy clubs. And then, you know, there was, there was a market for people who would do your act so they could hire them instead of hiring you because they could get them for half the price. You know, that happened on the road yeah. a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, there were just too many comedians and not enough clubs. And then, just the whole demographic changed. It's like the audiences are so different now. They're so bad. They're just, you know, and especially after COVID, they're just so used to not being around other people. Nobody knows how to act in public anymore. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. So weird. It's so it's weird. It's funny because I don't really do many clubs anymore. Uh, uh-huh. In a year, I do very few clubs. Well, I'll do. You know, you know what we say in the business, you know what that is? A sign. <laughs> It's time to get out. <laughs> you know, yeah. why did I walk right into that? I uh, No, but I mean, as far as I'm doing theaters, uh-huh. a lot of you, and I, I when I, when this first started happening, I thought, oh my God, I'll never do that. And they're my favorite shows ever, Firehouses. Uh-huh. Firehouses have the best rooms in the back. They have these amazing rooms mm-hmm. and, and they rent and they do shows. And you know what I found, Rob? When you're at a club, they kind of have this attitude of, all right, I had to come all the way here. I got to worry about DW. Make me laugh. But when you go into like a theater or even these firehouses or even an Elks club or something, everyone there is from the neighborhood and they have that look of, hey, you came here for me. They Mm -hmm. like they have that feeling of, isn't this great? These these guys are here and we're going to have a good time. And I, I, I just really like that. You know the reason why firehouses are, are great audiences for you? They're used to disasters. <laughs> That's how they make their living. <laughs> Bet you they loved your theme song, Burning Down the House. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that, don't you? Of course, because I was jealous that there was the no- Richie Burns show. Um Burns show. <laughs> What uh last time you were on that Tony fucked up. Um leave him alone. We we, t- we talked a lot more about the acting stuff. Uh-huh. And and it uh, you it was really interesting. And you really seem is that more your passion now? I mean, I, I know you're working with younger people and it's all it's, of that. It's what I had set out to do at the very beginning was do acting. And so yeah, me you too. know, when I when I started doing Broadway and then and started doing TV and you know, the one or two movies I've done. I mean, that was really where I envisioned myself, where I wanted to be, you know. Um, it's, you know, it's where I, all my training was. And I'm teaching uh, acting. I do uh, like an audition workshop and then I do coaching. Uh, I have a couple of students in Belfast, Ireland, uh, that I work with once a week. And I just helped uh, uh, a girl who was auditioning for her college production of uh, Funny Thing. I'm sorry, How to Succeed in Business uh, without really trying. She was auditioning for Rosemary. And so I worked with her on her audition and uh, she got the part. So, uh, oh, wow. Know, which was kind of neat. And then I uh, saw you on Broadway in that. Yeah, that was, that was, that was, it was interesting working with Dan Radcliffe because it was an entirely different level of, you know, it was like I kind of experienced a little bit of it when I did Odd Couple with um, Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick because, you know, they had their own little thing. But then when I did How to Succeed, uh, as first was was with, with Dan Radcliffe and then it was with um, Nick Jonas uh, when when Dan left. Um, it's just the, the audiences were just amazing. You know, they were just incredible. It was like sold out houses all the time. Mm-hmm. And the last show we did was a matinee. Uh, when we closed and um, it was of course packed with Nick Jonas's fans and uh, the big 11 o'clock number in that show is brotherhood of man. And we'd done it on the, we'd done it on the today show. We did it on letterman. We did it for the Macy's Thanksgiving day parade. I mean, we did it a number of times. It was an incredible 11 o'clock number. Just one of those, you get, you know, the hair stand up at the back of your neck. It was like one of those that just built a building. And, That's um, what they call it, eleven o'clock number. Yeah, because it happens about eleven o'clock before, mm-hmm. like night at the end of the show. It's usually mm-hmm. the big number before it's all over. You would think I'd know, and, but um, I don't. He, um, uh, so we did um, Brotherhood of Man for the audience, and Michael Yuri was playing Bud, 
uh, the the really sneaky nephew of the boss. Um, it was really great. Michael Yuri is, first of all, unbelievably talented actor, but a really terrific person on top of it. And when the show was over, uh, when, when the number was over, rather, we had to move the story along to change the scene with... Uh, with me addressing him and like telling everyone to get him out. Cause he turns out to be the bad guy. You know, if you've seen it, you, you know the point I'm talking about, but the show stopped cold. We got a 15 minute standing ovation after the number. We couldn't move the story forward. Brotherhood and of man. After brotherhood of man was over. And it was like, so funny because Yuri and I were like, I'm, eye contact across the stage from each other and we realized we were going to be able to move the show along so we were kind of like doing this little improv thing like just miming with each other just to kind of keep the story going and every time you'd try to start there'd be another wave of and it was really it was, we finally it was great it was that another, must be an awesome feeling it was it was an incredible feeling it really was it was great that's, now, that's yeah. the reason why you do live theater you know you see how long were you in in that show I was there for the whole run. I was there from, I think it was a year and a half. We were, I think it was a year and wow. a half. Um, and I, it was great because I played two parts. I played Mr. Twimble, who was the head of the mailroom right. and got to do a number with, you know, Dan and, and Nick, uh, you know, as a little duet, which was great. And then Brotherhood of Man is another character, Wally right. Wamper, who was the Wamper. CEO of the company at the end. And so I had, you know, my scene and my song in the first two two you know first two scenes at the beginning of the show and then i was in the last scene of the show yeah i had the entire time in the middle to just sleep in my dressing room i did i did that yeah. in college i played those two parts in college and i remember going this is the greatest because both roles are just so much fun and have yeah. such great songs yeah but and you right. have you're right you have all this time in between to just sit there and bask in your glory if you want yeah. you know yeah you get to do company way and then you get to do brotherhood of man that's like yeah Oh, we did it at the Tonys too, which was great because you know you're standing on stage and you're waiting for them to come back from commercial. And I'm looking oh. at Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and all these people like sitting right in the first row. You know, I was yeah. like, oh, really, really awesome. kind of cool. You know, that's cool, Rob. It was neat. It was neat. It was really neat. What was Larroquette like to work with? Just a joy. He's, he's just, yeah. He's so fucking funny. He was and so good. That was thing where after the first month or so, he knew he could do it, and so we used to have this little bit uh just before brotherhood of man where he would i would say somebody he'd react to it and he would change the way he reacted every time to try and make me laugh and he almost got me once but it was the hardest i've ever tried to keep from laughing because he was just so funny because he'd make these faces or or do something with his voice or just something it was different every night every performance it was really really they had, and then uh, didn't didn't Bo Bridges <laughs> take over for him? Yes, Bo Bridges took over for him when uh, Nick took over for uh, Dan. Bo Bridges took over for him, I and mean, he was a lot of fun too because I got to meet the dude um, when he came to see his brother in the show, which was kind of cool. Um, they had announced the Outer Critic Circle Awards um, in between shows on a Wednesday, between matinee and an evening performance, and John and I would stand off stage. Because neither one of us were in the opening number, we would all kind of go out after the night before the number was over. We'd go out for the last part of the the opening number, and uh, so we would stand backstage during the overture. And we had this ritual where we would stamp our feet, and it's always stupid, you know, rituals and and superstitions in the theater. Stamp our feet at a certain point in the in the overture. He turns me and says, "Congratulations," and I said. Um, Right, he said, for your nomination for the Outer Critics Circle Award. And I, I was flabbergasted just before we go, go out. And I'm actually get, getting choked up. I was like so, so moved. And it was so cool that he had acknowledged me, you know? Wow. So the minute I'm done with Company Way, my scenes are over. I go run back up to my dressing room and I get on my computer and I'm looking up. I want to see my name in the list of... of and, I'm not. A, I'm, my, my name isn't in the list of nominees. And then I notice, oh, it's Rob Ashford, the director. He he was nominated. Rob Ashford, not not Rob Bartlett. Rob Ashford for best director. No, no, Rob Bartlett for best supporting. Despite the fact that I was doing two separate roles, two scenes. 
<laughs> no intermission comes, and Lara Ketz shows up at my dressing room. He goes, I am so, so sorry. Ah. I am so, so sorry. I just, I read it real quick, and I am so, so sorry. And we, we had a laugh about it. Next day, I show up in my dressing room, and there's a trophy. Um, I forget what they called it. I got it somewhere. It's a, the, the official great guy award given to um the biggest funniest you know whatever i've ever known you you know no kidding john larroquette you know, just, he, he gave uh, it, it was just, a, just a classy guy you know wow. i have to, awesome. that to be true no matter who it is whether it's in tv or or film or or on broadway the bigger they are it seems like the more down to earth they are it's like when i did I that's know, why rick adon is a dick three what you got to be somebody to be somebody. Um, when I did um, The Good Wife, it was three or four episodes, same character. And uh, Juliana Margulies could not have been nicer, could not have been more welcoming, more, you know, are you okay? Do you want to try that again? You know, whatever you want. It was like, and then when I did Elementary, you know, it was like, the people there could could not be any any nicer. I I did my last scene in elementary. I was a, a fill in police captain for Aiden Quinn. Aiden Quinn had gotten shot at the end of the sixth season, and the seventh season was their last season. I played his old friend from the force years ago, who was coming in to fill in to run his squad and his own squad, um, Captain Dwyer, and I was like the no nonsense guy, lifetime cop, you know, just looking for retirement. And uh, my, I did five episodes, and the, the last episode, it, it's revealed that I have sexually harassed one of the female cops. You know, I don't know. I posted some joke or some picture of her in a bikini, whatever it was. And I had already been on warning for doing it once before, and Aiden Quinn knew that, and he found out that she was leaving, but she wouldn't say why she was leaving, so he suspected me. So I'm having lunch at this cop bar, and he comes in, and he needs to know. He wants to know. Is it true? And I lose it. I just say, you know, I start really. I did your job, Tommy, and I did it. I really, it's like pulling out all my acting muscles and uh, so go out, slam the door in my final scene. So when you're done on a set, um, when you've done your last, you know, scene, when you've shot the last thing, you're going to see it's uh, the director or the assistant director will say, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap for Rob Bartlett. Um, um, series, a series wrap or whatever it is. Uh, episode wrap for our apartment. and then everybody you know the the crew and the and the extras and all that, everybody applauds it's really just a nice little tribute yeah and so i walk out of the cup there's a cup bar on, on queen's boulevard i think right by the 59th street bridge and um aiden quinn is standing at the edge of the curb and he is arranged the wardrobe department the hair and makeup department most of the other actors were on the set, all the grips, all the assistants, all the PAs, has them lined up on two sides from the, from the door of the, of the bar all the way around the corner, leading all the way to my trailer. And they were all. Wow. I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's that just, awesome. that's what you hope, you know, it's when you hope that that kind of stuff happens. You know, you, you see these people, you get a good, good feeling about them and you hope that it's going to be, and it was always just a great experience. Is that something you think he does for a lot of actors? Or he, was it because he knew no. you personally? or no, He loved me. We had a real, like, big brother, little brother relationship. We were wow. special to each other, you know. Like me and Mark. I slept in his arms <laughs> one afternoon. Um, he held me, you know. I suckled at his breast. It was a very special. <laughs> You're gonna speak of it's Tony. It's almost nap time. <laughs> Would you leave him alone? We suck with each other. Tony, Tony, you should just fucking quit. Like just quit, like in the middle, and then watch them try to push the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was such a beautiful story. It and, was. Uh, uh, we should we should wrap on that. Yeah, Rob Bartlett suckling on Benny from Benny and June's breast. That's what I'm going to picture. I hope you're all picturing the same at home. That's the weirdest exit I've ever seen, Mark. Are you stoned? Are you stoned? 
No, Maybe. he's loaded. He's been loaded since 10 o'clock this morning. He has bacon and eggs and then two bottles of Bushmills by the time he gets to his little studio. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to do this right, folks. That was drinks, jokes, and storytelling. You know, I just, I just got to say, you guys, I break your balls, and and you know that it's done with love. Um, I, I've known you guys. I don't know how many years, Richie. You and I go way back. And Mark, yeah. I really only met you a couple of years ago, but you've been, you've been, uh, you know, a great source of of pleasure and fun, and, and I always feel honored that you, you know, include me as a guest every once in a while on the show, because I know it's not really easy to do this kind of stuff, you know, week after week after week, and then try to be entertaining and bring it to the people. And, and, and while, all the while you're trying to like have families and, and do stand up. But, you know, there's one thing I got to say about you guys. It's that each one of you. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew he was going to do that. <laughs> He's so friggin' funny, dude. Uh, he is just one of the funniest human beings I've ever literally ever met in my life. And we we're comics. I've met we've yeah. met so many comics. Yeah. But that that man is just so goddamn funny. <laughs>